we're uh, ready to get started for the afternoon. Uh, watch, Jackie, when you stand up, just watch your, you know, behind you. <laughs> so uh, this part of the room, we thought the slides, some of the slides are a little hard to read. There you go, your own big screen TV. <laughs> So I wonder how that's going to work. Oh, yeah, you can, Max, Max, I can see you from here. OK, good. <laughs> All right. Colin? Oh, we're all ready to go. Yeah, I think we're, well, it's, it's 10 after, so we're, we're ready to go. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Colin Caveney and I'm the Consultancy Director here at Highwire. And, uh, <clears throat> and really today's session is to introduce you to some of the services that we can now offer. Uh, it's a, one of the benefits of the acquisition of Symantico and, uh, and some new hires <clears throat> that we can now offer you um, some consulting services in the area of web analytics. Uh, and this session really is to highlight some of the uh, options specifically available within Google Analytics that we believe uh, are, are valuable to everybody. So uh, hopefully this is an entry level talk and uh, if you'd like to discuss this in more detail, Graham and I will be running a breakout session later this afternoon uh, and of course you can come and grab us uh, in any of the breaks. So, uh, web analytics, <clears throat> um, the tools we have access to these days uh, really provide us with a, a plethora of data uh, and numerous ways to view and report upon this. However, uh, it's all too easy to get caught up in the data available and, and just sort of starting to report on numbers for numbers sake. So. We really recommend that <clears throat> when looking at any of this data that, that we're capturing, uh, that it's made available to you and you use it in a, in a structured way. So we have this sort of process that, <laughs> that we adhere to um, ourselves. So obviously you have to record the data. It's very important to benchmark that at certain points so that you've got a reference point to refer back to at a later date. Of course, you're recording it, so you need to review it. And one of the items we want to sort of highlight today is that <clears throat> when you're record, uh, re re reviewing all of this data that you've recorded, that the context of that data um, really is key and critical. So that adds a lot more insight into the data and the reports that you are looking at. So you've captured some data, you review it, you understand its context and how it applies to you, and that out of that you should be identifying revisions to either your website, your content, and then repeat that process. And, and that's a, you know, a continuous cycle that you should be going through uh, as you strive to improve the experience for your, for your users. Now, as I mentioned, <clears throat> primarily I'm going to be talking about Google Analytics. <clears throat> so a quick recap, uh, I'm sure everyone is aware <laughs> what Google Analytics is, but it, it is a world-class um, analytics package, um, and, and the great news is it's free. It's available on all jCore installations, so anybody with a jCore platform, um, Google Analytics can be set up for you on that. <clears throat> and the beauty of it is that it does offer some really nice customizable uh, aspects within that. And put that together, it's really being used to analyze behaviors and trends. And uh, I mention that because quite often in conversations that I've been involved in, that I've overheard and anecdotal from colleagues, um, Google Analytics can be confused with other, with other areas in our, in our industry. So it is not Google Tag Manager. Um, as was spoken about earlier today, you know, Google Tag Manager is about helping you inject specialist tags into that 
into, <coughs> into your report data. Uh, it can enable you to do things like campaign tracking. And it's also powerful in, in that it, it enables you to inject some third-party tools. So it's, it's a very complementary service, but it doesn't replace uh, Google Analytics. Uh, Google Analytics is not counter-reporting, so counter-reporting has very idiosyncratic rules um, that define how usage reports are, are governed and reported, and Google Analytics does not replicate this. It's also not usage visor, so usage visor, if you really want to dig in and understand at a, at a very high, uh, at a very granular level uh, with high numbers of access data, uh, then Usage Visor is for you. So Google Analytics, um, one of the aspects of it is that <coughs> if you're trying to view a large time frame or if you have a very busy site, uh, then it has uh, a component within it called sampling. But if you're trying to request too much data, then it tries to sort of dumb that down and, and give you a best guess answer. So if you want to know absolutes, then something like Usage Visor is much more applicable to you because that's looking at real usage from the actual data logs of your platform. And so because of that, uh, sort of not as accurate as it could be, um, it means that it's also not really applicable for detailed royalty and revenue reporting. Now obviously, <coughs> Google Analytics offers um, a whole variety of reports. Um, you know, you can run numerous reports, you can apply many, many filters to them, and uh, there's a real danger that you get, you get lost in there. It's a real rabbit's warren of, uh, of options. Um, an analogy I like to make is, uh, it's like when you go to the supermarket, you can go there without a shopping list, but if you come out <coughs> with only the items that you intended to go in there for, I'll be amazed. So <laughs> you have to be really disciplined uh, to ensure that you get out what you came in to look for. So <clears throat> there is a concept called custom dashboards. And effectively, these are like your shopping lists. So you can, you can predefine what you're after um, in a very neat package so that whenever you go and report uh, within Google Analytics, you know that you're getting to the, the important data really easily and that it's being reported in a consistent way that you've, you know, you've put the intelligence into initially to set up. So um, I love to bleed an analogy dry, um, and I also don't relish <coughs> a trip to the supermarket. So the alerting service in Google Analytics is very much like getting the groceries delivered to your door. So you can uh, get an email of those dashboard reports or other reports sent to you. So once we've set up the service in Google Analytics, if, if we've done all the work up front, and we make smart use of this alerting mechanism, you know, you don't have to go in there very often. So you only have to dip in there if you want to look at something um, in a bit more detail. The other part that, so obviously you can get reports sent to you. <clears throat> the other interesting aspect is that key events within the system can also be trigger an alert out to you. So for example, you want to, might want to be notified of a particular milestone on your platform, you know, maybe, when you exceed the maximum number of users that have visited your site. That's, that's something to celebrate. Get it alerted to you, and you can go and uh, understand why. Now, segmentation is, uh, is also a really interesting aspect of Google Analytics. Um, and this is a way to apply a filter um, over the top of uh, your standard reports and you can apply one or two filters and you can compare them side by side. And this really helps you review the data in, in some appropriate context. So um, as an example, let's say that uh, use on your mo uh, of mobile devices on your site is reported as 5% of your user base, okay? Uh, well, in that instance, if you're looking at those raw numbers, you might interpret that Having a, a responsive site is not that important for your, for, your, for, your, um, for your website, for your user base. However, if we had applied a segment and a filter to that that only shows traffic from your subscribers <coughs> and that for your subscribers, they were actually 40% of the time coming onto the site via a, a mobile device, then that, you know, that changes the message entirely and that shows that it's much more important 
and so you would want to um, you know apply more rigor to the uh, the usability on of, uh, of your site on a mobile device so it's just a way of ensuring that when you're looking at this data you can switch contexts and you can look at it in a through a particular um, lens Uh, annotations are also quite nice. I mean, this is a really simple feature, but it's just, a, it's just a great way of adding some memory into the reports that you look at within Google Analytics. So in this particular example here, um, we've got this uh, sort of abnormal spike in users on the platform. And, you know, this is over a three-month period. So you're going to say, hey, you know, what happened on that particular day to double the number of users coming onto my site? You ask around, you speak to your colleagues, <coughs> and you find out it was the result of a, of a marketing campaign. An email went out that morning. Um, so you can just add a, a, a small label uh, to that data point so that in the future, you know, another three months' time, you don't have to remember that that's why that spike occurred. It's embedded into that report for you and also for your colleagues as well. So you, you retain a bit of institutional memory within the analytics that you're viewing. So now we start to get into uh, a bit more specific features within Google Analytics that we really like. Um, so site search is one that is particularly interesting, uh, certainly to me. Uh, <coughs> so this is about searches performed within your platform. So it's not the searches that people are applying in Google and being referred to your site. These are the searches that they are applying when they get to your your particular platform. And <clears throat> you get very interesting uh, reports. So this is like the top 10 search terms that have been used on that particular platform. Uh, some of them are fairly gruesome, so don't, <laughs> don't look at them in too much detail. <clears throat> but what you could uh, infer from this is that if, if people are regularly searching for a particular term, then this could be an indicator that you may want to develop a custom collection around that. Um, you may want to use one of the hero panels on your homepage or, or on the sidebars to promote people into that collection area or to specific articles that relate to that uh, content type. There's goals in e-commerce. So this is really delving a bit deeper again. Um, so within Google Analytics, you have the capability of uh, defining a goal that you want your users to achieve. An example of that could be, hey, you know, I really want to promote uh, personalization account registration so that I can gather email addresses for my users, I can build my uh, marketing database. That might be a goal that you want to achieve. So you can set that up in Google Analytics and enable you to track the, uh, the success of that and, and how, uh, <coughs> how many people actually fulfill that goal that you've set up. And if we think back earlier to the, the alerting, you can also then um, assign a, an alert to that so that you know if you get a big influx of, uh, of sign-ups, you can go and start marketing to this new group of people. And then likewise, we have e-commerce. Um, and again, you know, if we've hooked up e-commerce into your platform and we assign uh, that to Google Analytics, then there are a whole set of specialist reports in there that can give you a snapshot of the, you know, the revenue generated via e-commerce. And also, quite importantly, the, the journey of people through that uh, transaction funnel. You can see if anybody falls out midway through the transaction and how many people maybe you're losing uh, you know, and, and, and revenue that you could be missing out on and understand why. Custom dimensions. So this is really where we get to the business end of Google Analytics. Um, and this, personally, I believe is the key part. You know, this is where you really can start to inject very contextual information uh, into the data that Google is recording um, that you can then utilize in pretty much every report that you run um, thereafter. And most importantly is account information. So when you log into a, a particular platform, <coughs> The, the platform that assigns that user or that institution an account ID. And because that's non-identifiable information, you can actually store that within a custom dimension. 
uh, which means that thereafter you can then look at your reports through a particular for a particular organization you can look at reports for well, how do my subscribers <coughs> interact with the site how do my pay-per-view subscribers interact with the site how do my you know <coughs> how do my sort of freemium customers interact with the site? So as soon as you start adding in account information or subscription information, it means that you can really then start to get a better picture of specific groups of your users and how they're interacting with your platform. Likewise with content, so you may also want to add in subject codes um, or you know, specific information around a journal volume or issue that again will enable you thereafter to report upon some of those specifics. So you may see that people in a certain subject area in <coughs> interact with your site entirely differently from your general populace. And that could indicate that you need to set up a, a specialist site or a specialist area for that subject. And last but not least, uh, maybe website functions is also an interesting area. You, know, you could have invested in a specialist custom feature on your website. And by applying some custom dimension information to that, uh, enables you to really track the, uh, the success of you implementing that feature. Uh, in this example here, we've um, highlighted that maybe search is an area that you're really interested in. So maybe you want to track how many search results are returned for an average search. So you can see how, how uh, sort of specific the information is being returned. <coughs> and this second one is really interesting. Um, what result number a user clicked upon? You know, so if you're seeing a very high number there, so that people are having to maybe go off the first page or look down the bottom of the search results, then maybe you want to uh, talk to us and we can discuss some search tuning and, and maybe assess the, the metadata that you're assigning to your articles to ensure that you get a more effective return in the search results. So those are all uh, sort of data aspects, and they're via the standard reporting that you get in Google Analytics. There's also quite a nice uh, interaction uh, through the in-page analytics. <coughs> and this is where you can actually go and visit your own website. Uh, you use the uh, Google Analytics plugin for Chrome, and it will overlay uh, how many times people, you know, what percentage of people click on the various links that you have on that page. So that's quite a nice visual way of seeing how people interact with your site. If that's interesting to you, <coughs> then we can offer, uh, through Google Tag Manager, we can actually embed a service called Crazy Egg. <coughs> and this is lovely. This, is, this really gives you a, a much more interesting um, view of how your users are interacting. So here's a confetti, <coughs> confetti uh, visualization. And this shows you all the areas of the site that the user is clicking upon, all the areas of that particular page, you know, what they've clicked upon. And uh, you can see the high density and the concentration here um, is for the main navigation and then for the search. So it sort of really gives you an indicator of, of what are the most popular areas. And that can inform placement and importance of them. There's also this heat map. So this is, uh, this is about sort of dwell time uh, on a particular page. <coughs> and you'll see that this area here is, uh, is white hot. So that's indicating to us, and there's research that, that backs this up, that people um, basically bypass this, this top section of the site because historically they've learned that that contains an advert or maybe it contains non-critical site functions. So if they're, if they're there for a meaningful, meaningful full purpose on the site, actually read something, they skip past that and then get to the meat of the content, which is you know, typically the abstract, <coughs> the journal information, uh, table of contents, et cetera. <coughs> and on a particularly large article page, you know, this can be very interesting that you can see you know, obvious hot areas near the top, but then you can also get interesting hot areas lower down in the article that maybe relate to um, images or, or figures. You know, that those are the things that people often hover upon because they, uh, they uh, capture their interest. 
And also the one of the interesting parts here is that less so 60% of your users don't go into that blue area. So it's pretty amazing how, many, how, how important that top area of the page is. If you don't capture their attention pretty immediately and provide them the information they're looking for, um, you're not going to retain their, their interest. So of course, looking at all these numbers and getting the machine to tell us <coughs> what it's inferred from all of your usage is great. Um, but you know, this is a bit tricky for me, uh, being a man. But don't be f afraid to just ask. You know, go and go and speak to your users. Go and understand. You know what it is exactly that they are after. <coughs> we can help to arrange uh, and facilitate user groups, um, define personas. Certainly, like this morning in the. We saw from Jack how important having personas were to validate all of the work that you're doing on the platform. And uh, you know, we, we think that's a critical component. And so in summary, uh, use Google to uh, configure, be configured really to answer the questions you pose. So capture data, that's great. But make sure that you're capturing data in a way to answer the questions that you're very interested in. <clears throat> Ensure that you add context to the data so that you do get more insightful return upon the reports that, that, uh, that it provides to you. And most importantly, realize that you're doing this to understand your users' behavior, um, talk to them, and that the outputs of all of these activities and the work that you put in up front should be part of a continual cycle to ensure that you're driving improvement and adjustment and refinement of your website. So hopefully, I gave you a very uh, brief overview of all of the, 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 the simple facilities that are available, available in Google Analytics today and that we can help you with. <coughs> I'm delighted to say that uh, as an attendee benefit to, the, to this conference, um, we're offering a free Google Analytics consultation uh, and configuration of a dashboard for you. So please come badger myself, uh, Graham, find Ophir, uh, drop us your business card, and, uh, and we will arrange a follow-up to discuss in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions? The, the, the sort of the headline here uh, uh, to me is after years of uh, many of you telling us that you find it really challenging to deal with uh, uh, these wonderful free services like Google Analytics, uh, we now can help. Uh, we have a consultancy uh, and are able to help you with, uh, with this. And uh, folks like Colin lead the consultancy service. And uh, these, th could you put your summary slide back of up? Of course. Um, these things are not just telling you. You should configure. You should add context. <laughs> you should. We can help. Yeah. That's, that, I think, is the, the big headline uh, for what the new uh, capability is. So a uh, question, Nandini, in the back? Can you talk a little more about the custom dimensions? Basically, I saw something about the articles. Sorry? The custom, custom dimensions. Ah, uh, yes. <coughs> so. So when so within Google, uh, so when you go to a page um, and you send data off to, to Google, there are things called custom dimensions that really you can fill in with any information that, that you can extrapolate from the page that the user is on. So you know, we help with that. So as part of jQuery, we can expose certain features. There are certain default uh, pieces of metadata that, that are available in the jQuery template. You know, we can talk to you talk to us about exposing further information if you've got a specific need. But as, <coughs> as soon as that information is available in the page, then it can be wrapped up and sent in the, uh, in the communication back to Google Analytics. And then once we've got it and we understand what it is, then we can start to build specific reports or dashboards or um, events and triggers around that. Yeah. Do you have experience in ha have fine tuning those and putting them into analytics? 
Could you repeat the question? Yeah, certainly. So the question was, um, gentleman has <laughs> experimented with Google AdWords, had good success with that. Is there any way that we can advise on, yeah, exactly, advise on how to get more from it? working um, many many were focused on usage um, within the site and um, so not so much on, on AdWords okay. you know being honest and um, so as Colin as Colin showed around crazy and all our sales many around usage and how people are coming to the site but less around AdWords but we can definitely have a chat about that afterwards are there uh, questions suggestions all right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Greg? So I mentioned uh, this morning that we had uh, uh, six partners uh, uh, with us today, uh, that there are partner breakouts. Uh, one of our, uh, and it's some of those were partners in progress. Uh, one of them uh, is Meta, where we've just started the process, uh, but it seemed like such a good opportunity uh, to put in front of you what, what Meta does, especially now that it's, it's part of a, a much larger uh, initiative, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, that uh, took advantage of Greg being here on vacation. Uh, to, uh, to come and see us and describe uh, what kind of thing we're trying to put together in, in partnership uh, to offer you. Greg? Fantastic. Thank you, um, John. And thanks, everyone, for, uh, for being here. This is a, a really great opportunity. Um, and I'm happy to speak to you um, probably for 10 or 15 minutes or so about Meta and then to answer uh, specific questions that you may have. Um, I have worked with Meta uh, since 2013. Uh, managing strategic partnerships, particularly as pertains to the uh, publishing industry. Um, I am a recovering publisher myself, uh, so I know this space well. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about uh, who Meta is, what we do, um, how we are uh, now part of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and how we uh, are working with both individual publishers and hopefully with the, the Highwire uh, family moving forward. There are a series of ambitious goals that I'm going to uh, enumerate over the, the, the course of this, uh, this discussion. Uh, Meta was founded by uh, a cancer uh, genomicist uh, in Toronto uh, in, in 2011. Um, and he observed uh, as a researcher that um, there is a particular challenge that I'm sure um, you're all aware of either directly or indirectly. Uh, and that is that there is a, um, uh, I think the, um, Fair way to say it, there's a ton of information uh, that is being published uh, on a daily basis. There are 4,000 papers. I'm sure I'll have a slide up here shortly that says this. There are 4,000 papers uh, that are published every day. Um, and as a researcher, that's a challenge. Um, so I think you probably all know that, that your end users cobble together uh, strategies for, for staying abreast of what's happening in their fields. Um, they have saved searches, they have uh, PubMed searches, they have table of contents, RSS alerts, all sorts of these different processes that, that, that get Frankenstein together. Um, but those are inefficient, um, and they're inefficient in two ways. One is uh, they let a lot of stuff in that is not relevant uh, to the individual uh, researcher, so a lot of stuff that's really just noise for them. They also don't catch everything that is relevant, so you're left with a situation where there are too many false positives and too many false negatives uh, associated with, with research results. Uh, and Meta is uh, predicated on the notion that uh, some of the technical advances that we've seen in other fields uh, over the last uh, five or 10 years can, can be applied uh, to uh, scholarly research and can uh, create better efficiencies. Um, so the, the, the fundamental premise is, what if we could machine read every paper that has ever been published um, understand what those papers are about, how they connect to each other, and how they connect to the interests of individual researchers. Uh, wouldn't that be great if we could do that? Um, and that's what Meta has devoted uh, the past five or six years to, to doing. Um, we built a team, um, about 30 people, now it's actually about 40 people, um, based largely in Toronto, um, primarily uh, data scientists and, and AI experts. 
Um, and as, as John alluded to, um, we had a, a very interesting uh, event um, uh, a few months ago uh, where the, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is uh, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook and his wife, uh, Dr. Priscilla Chan, um, they have an initiative uh, with the very ambitious goal. This is an ambitious goal. Their goal is an order of magnitude more ambitious, which is to uh, cure, treat, or manage uh, all diseases by the end of the century. Um, and they acquired Meta um, in uh, January of this year and moved us to an exclusively non-commercial model. And I'll explain what that means in, in just a minute. Um, but the reason uh, they brought Meta into the fold um, is because there's a fundamental belief within CZI uh, that we can make fundamental advances in the scientific realm by providing better basic tools to the research community. Uh, one of those tools, they believe, um, is uh, better discovery. If people had a better sense of what was going on and what was directly relevant to their own work in the labs, on the bench, that that would create an accelerating impact. I mentioned lots of papers. You all know this. This is all data that, that, that folks in this room know very, very well. Um, what we have done um, is we have built a knowledge graph. Um, so we have relationships with um, 80 or 100 different publishers, some of whom are in this room. Um, and we have, it's, it's an indexing relationship. Um, and we take uh, the full text of your articles. We don't serve it in any way. We don't share it. There's no posting of the files. But we machine read those files. Uh, and from them, we extract lots and lots of information to create uh, a better index, if you will. Um, we normalize 20 million different concepts. And across those 20 million different concepts, um, we have about 5 billion connections within this knowledge graph. So this relates to this, which relates to this, which relates to that. Um, humans are very, very good at this. Um, this is not meant to replace the work that uh, human uh, researchers or reviewers or editors do. This is meant to supplement that. Um, it's foolish not to use the technology at our disposal um, to, to create uh, better tools that make our lives more efficient. Um, so again, we have these relationships with, uh, with the publishers. Um, we've, we've built this knowledge graph, um, and that allows us to do uh, some interesting things. Um, fundamentally, the knowledge graph drives uh, everything that we do, but there are three specific elements that I want to talk about uh, here today. The first is uh, MetaScience, which is the end user um, discovery engine uh, that um, we have 100,000 or so users uh, and growing fairly dramatically uh, that are uh, signed up and using uh, on a regular basis to stay abreast of, of developments in their fields of interest. Completely free, um, somewhat um, um, uh, ironically, uh, when we were acquired by Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, which is designed to unlock all this and make it more available, more open, more free, the first thing that we do we did was put up a not a, not a paywall, but we put up a a, a temporary meter um, to to uh, restrict access to new members. So we're building, rebuilding uh, some of the infrastructure to scale. Um, to, to handle both the amount of content and also the, the amount of users uh, that are uh, projected uh, to benefit from this. And so if you go to the meta.science meta site right now, you can sign up to basically pre-register. Um, there are folks that are using it today. They're, they're grandfathered in. Um, we'll release that gate uh, within a matter of weeks, um, and then it'll be free for anyone to sign up and use. So. Again, uh, I, I talked about how this works. The idea is uh, if we can machine read uh, all of these papers, uh, we can have a better understanding of what is most relevant to individ individual users and their interests. Folks sign up, they fill out, it's basically a questionnaire, and they talk about the things that matter to them. Um, and we then create almost like a Twitter feed that appears on their, uh, their user page. It gets updated in real time, so if you publish a paper today, we index it tomorrow, it appears immediately on, on, on the user's feed. Um, and they're able to explore, they're able to look at related concepts, they're able to look at uh, authors who have, have written on this subject, journals that publish a lot of content uh, in, in these areas. Um, and ultimately, they're able to click on a link that's going to take them to your site for fulfillment. Um, so as I said, we have access to the full text. We use that for indexing purposes only. Uh, we don't have any sort of uh, file sharing. This is not 
uh, ResearchGate, it's not Sci-Hub, it's not any of those things. Uh, the, the ultimate uh, final act uh, of a user who's interested in learning more is to click on a link that takes them to your page for fulfillment. Again, this is a, you know, just showing a, 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 a sample paper and all the different things that we can extract, affiliation, authors, co-authors, concepts. Um, and, and obviously, um, we're not just pulling from the metadata, we're pulling from that entire uh, paper and breaking it apart and seeing how frequently things are mentioned and how close, uh, closely terms are mentioned uh, in relation to each other and so forth. <coughs> so we have, we've created these, these pages. We're, particularly strong in, in areas of biomedicine. So if you think about a series of concentric circles, biomedicine was our primary initial area of focus. That's expanded out to the larger life sciences, the physical sciences, broader STM, including uh, engineering, computer science, and so forth, the social sciences, humanities. Um, so we are uh, ingesting as much content from as many sources uh, across as many subjects as we possibly can. Um, if you're interested in uh, cancer research, um, you're probably going to find meta more useful than if you're uh, into medieval studies. Um, just moving forward, um, again, really this is a, is a discovery service. So we think about um, the way folks get access to content. Um, and obviously, there are always going to be folks who have research questions who go to Google or Google Scholar or other services and type in a question and get a list of results. And you can do that on meta as well. Our typical user behavior is really um, folks set up uh, these feeds for the things that interest them. They come back. They see how the feeds are being populated. Um, so that, that's more of the behavior that we see here. And the interaction is fantastic. Uh, we're finding that the average user session is about 15 minutes, um, which is an incredibly rich interaction uh, for, for folks. We obviously just had an analytics section, uh, session. Uh, that's an incredibly um, um, uh, deep engagement that we're finding for our users. So one of the things that's exciting, um, there are a lot of things that are exciting about the, the Chan Zuckerberg acquisition. Um, they have an oatmeal bar every other Thursday. I mean, that's exciting, right? <laughs> um, but probably more germane uh, to, to this conversation is some of the tools um, that as a small <laughs> Canadian startup um, uh, we were licensing um, to partners are now um, available uh, on a non, or will be made available on a non-commercial basis uh, to the community. Um, and I want to talk specifically in some detail about something called bibliometric intelligence next. So uh, bibliometric intelligence is a tool. Um, it's a real tool. It's not hypothetical. It's been tested on uh, between two and three million real scholarly articles. Um, and it's used uh, by editors um, to uh, provide some insights into submitted manuscripts. Um, so the way that this works is a manuscript uh, gets submitted to a journal. Um, a copy of the paper gets routed uh, to Meta. We don't add it to the knowledge graph. We don't uh, put it on any sort of public-facing server. We run it through uh, an analytics engine that we have. Um, and within a 24-hour period, we generate a report um, that gets redeposited back in the editorial workflow um, and tells the editors uh, some, some interesting things. Um, so it provides an analysis of the likely impact of the paper. So impact is measured by three, projected three-year eigenfactor, uh, projected citation count uh, over a three-year period, and also where that sits relative to the rest of the scholarly, scholarly literature. So is this uh, in the top 5% of impact? Is it the, in the, the top 50% of impact? Um, it also provides um, a journal matching score. So based on our understanding of what this journal has published historically, um, how good a fit is this uh, for, for the journal? Um, it also provides uh, suggested reviewers as well. So based on analysis of the literature, um, based on not just this paper and the papers it cites, but based on the papers that those papers cite and how similar this paper is to the corpus of published literature who potential reviewers uh, 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 might be. Um, this is obviously uh, different. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, this is not, um, I, I mentioned before, that we're not uh, trying to replace uh, humans in the, in the scholarly process. This is a, a prime example of that. Um, we can do some interesting analysis. We can draw some uh, interesting projections based on these papers. 
Um, editors uh, are the ultimate um, uh, arbiters, right? They have their expertise, um, and they bring that expertise to bear in the management of the journals as well they should. This provides them with some additional data, some additional insights to do their jobs. Um, it is, again, not meant to replace anything uh, that they're already doing. It's meant to complement uh, what they're doing. The best use case that I can, I can cite for this is uh, imagine that there is a manuscript get, that gets submitted among the, whatever, 200 or 300 or 500 manuscripts that your journal gets on a weekly or a monthly basis. And imagine there's a, a, a manuscript that is potentially a superstar manuscript, one that really is going to have a lot of, of impact. And I don't just mean impact in terms of the, the data, the metrics that I'm talking about. I mean impact in terms of making a difference. Um, it would be nice uh, to publish that paper. Um, it would be nice uh, to have that paper as part of your, your corpus. Um, I would not in any way suggest that uh, that paper uh, get accepted automatically based on a report, uh, a bibliometric intelligence report, but it might be useful to fast track it for, uh, for evaluation, to send it out for peer review and to make sure that it gets through the system uh, in, in an expedited fashion. Uh, that's the type of use case that we're finding um, uh, editors are, are using this technology for. Again, accelerating the, the, the research life cycle is what, what I talked about. Um, there's a component of this um, that we, uh, so, sorry, uh, just to square the circle on that. Um, this is a tool that has been a commercial tool. It will be a non-commercial tool. What that means is um, we will have a public API for any of our indexing partners that want to use this technology, they'll be able to use it. Um, and we will integrate with um, specific systems. Um, Benchpress is one of the, the systems we're, we're discussing integration and what that would look like, but also Editorial Manager and Scholar One and tools like that. Um, and we hope the community uses uh, this tool and we hope that, that they find benefit from it. Um, there's a flavor of this um, that we will provide, as opposed to via an API, uh, we will also provide via a secure login um, a similar type of report for newly published papers. So obviously once a paper is accepted by a specific journal, the journal that accepts it changes the calculation a little bit. Now it's not just uh, a, a, an abstract uh, monogram, uh, 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 sorry, a hypothetical manuscript that could be published someplace, but it's an actual journal article appearing in an actual journal. Um, and so we uh, will have a dashboard uh, for our publisher partners. They'll be able to log into, and they'll be able to see some predictions on the first uh, six months of that paper's life, what we think the trajectory is going to look like in terms of impact. Um, and that's important, obviously, because papers take a while to accrue citations. So this gives you, hopefully, some um, uh, predictive insights in, into where that paper is going to go. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and then I'll pause for questions, is, is something called horizon scanning. One of the things that I think Meta does well is we look at data. We look at data about published papers, and we're able to make some interesting predictions. Obviously, we just talked about it at the manuscript level, which is a very, very granular level. But we can also do that at a higher level as well. Um, and that's what horizon scanning is about. So horizon scanning is a predictive intelligence agent uh, uh, engine that basically looks at um, what is going to be talked about at the high wire meeting, at the AAAS meeting, um, at, at various meetings in 2019, 2020, 2021. Um, we're trying to be able to um, discern before the human eye can um, what these emerging topics are. Um, and so what we've done is we've taken um, a technology that was developed by uh, SRI just, uh, just up the road um, in conjunction with the US government, with the uh, IARPA group. Um, they spent a, a five-year program, there was about $30 million invested in this technology to, again, try to understand um, this notion of emergence, to try and create a, a technical way to define emergence within science. Um, we scan the scientific literature as well as a variety of other, we call them somewhat anachronistically, we call them exotic content sources, but things like uh, patent data um, and also fo uh, uh, foreign data sources as well to create, again, the notion is sort of this crystal ball for science and technology. Um, one of the things that's a challenge for us in this new sort of, uh, not sort of, this new non-commercial space um, is we had created a very, very robust, very, very rich, very, very, um, frankly, dense uh, product um, that we were licensing to life sciences and, and big pharma and, and organizations like that. 
Um, we're in the process of putting together an interface which is um, a little bit more consumer friendly. So you can see here, this is what horizon scanning looks like today. There are all these sliders and there are various, various concepts and there's this an emergence score and there's a prominence. Um, the feedback that we've had is it's a bit too much information. Um, and so we're in the process, as I said, of, of, of streamlining that um, and figuring out how to make it available to the community. And going forward, that's really our idea is uh, we have this knowledge graph. Um, we want to be able to tell stories about trends in research. Um, and we want to be able to provide tools that make that information actionable. Um, and we're really pleased to be uh, in conversation uh, with Highwire about how to be able to unfold and unspool these tools to you as a community. Um, and in the interim, uh, obviously we have relationships with maybe a half a dozen or so uh, Highwire publishers directly, um, and we're happy to continue those conversations as well. Um, so I'll pause uh, for questions. My contact information is there, and of course anyone who wants to to learn more about this directly um, can email me at any point. I'd be happy to talk. But let me, let me open it up for questions and see what, uh, what folks are interested in. Questions for Greg? Susan? Oh, go ahead. We'll just repeat the question. Yes. A absolutely. So, so the idea behind the API, right? Would you is, uh, repeat the question? Sure. So the question is, uh, if if uh, using an editorial management system not among those that I listed, uh, what happens then? Um, and we're happy to to integrate with any system. Um, uh, the notion behind an API, obviously, is you can uh, plug it in, right? And so we'll provide uh, some general direction to plug it in. But we'll also work with you if you have specific questions about, okay, how do we? What does the integration path look like? Our team can help set that up. Absolutely. Um, with the horizon scanning, that's only for the tools. Do you actually include graph information in there? That's part Re of it. That's Repeat part, the question. So the question is within horizon scanning, is there is there grant information that's embedded in with that? And that is part of that exotic content set is, is, is grants grants information. Drawn from a couple different databases. Um, primarily US, but not exclusively. Yep. Uh, Anurag, you have a mic? Oh, no, you, go ahead. Go ahead. And then hand it to Kristen. So I was really intrigued by both the bibliometric intelligence and the horizon scanning. You had mentioned that bibliometric intelligence had been in use for a while by uh, many editors. I was wondering if there were some examples of diamonds in the rough that were uncovered by bibliometric intelligence that were otherwise not seen by the editors. Because the most common thing that you would use is who wrote it. That's the most, by far, the highest, strongest predictor of whether this paper is likely to be successful. The challenge, of course, is to find ones that you don't have that history. I'd be really intrigued if there were examples yeah, that. I, I'd be, and, and in fact, anyone who's interested, uh, again, if you if you email me, I'd be happy <laughs> to send you a white paper that actually digs into that. It is obviously uh, uh, who, who the authors are, uh, where they're affiliated with. These are there's a high correlation, but it's it's certainly not. That's what's interesting, right? Of course, is is. Um, we all, as editors, have these shorthands that we use, right? So this gets to the top of the pile because the person's from Harvard or because I know them or they're in this lab or that lab. And obviously there is some correlation there, um, but it also becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and so we want to try and break through that a little bit. Yep. Uh, my question sort of related also with respect to bibliometric intelligence. What are you doing to test the outputs of the tool in, in real life, if you will. Yep, yeah, so uh, the, the start of it was actually we uh, uh, rewound the knowledge graph to 2011. So we looked at uh, papers that were published in specific months. So we looked at, I think, October 2011 and January 2012. So these are um, before they had accrued anything. We then stripped away where they were published. So whether it was a science uh, paper or a PLOS One paper, we stripped that away. So the system, in effect, didn't know it. And we offered predictions, again, on, uh, well, we did it in 1.1 million in the first tranche, 1.1 million papers. And then we compared that to, in 2014, what had actually happened, so what had actually occurred. We then recalibrated and ran it on another million papers, uh, and, and again, uh, compared to the actual results. Um, they're predictions, right? So they're not perfect. Um, at scale, uh, they're, they're pretty darn good, though, is the answer. 
And again, I, I'm, I'm happy to provide uh, more documentation because it's a very, very interesting question. Also, if anyone's really interested, we can get the, the, the data geeks on the phone and they would be uh, happy to spend probably more time than you would want on that question. Was there a sufficient recall number? Of the, of the predictions, we made 10 predictions and five were bad. I, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you, sir. So normally in any such prediction, you have a predi uh, precision recall number. I made 10 predictions. Five were right, yes. five were not so right. So I have a 50% precision, I have a uh, yes. maybe uh, whatever percent recall. I was wondering if from the white paper that you mentioned if you might be able to share a precision recall number. Uh, the paper might, I don't off the top of my head have it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Other questions? In the, uh, where? Yep. As you guys retool meta.com, are there gonna be APIs and or widgets for that for, for embeddability back to our We hope so. I mean, the idea, like I said, is, is, is not only to uh, provide these insights, but to make them actionable, right? And th that idea of actionable is uh, both for the individual researcher, but also for the community. Um, and, and the specific, specifics of that, I don't want to, um, I don't want to tap dance around, but it's, it's a little bit of an open question in the sense that, um, this has all gone down relatively recently. And so figuring out sort of how the, the sequencing of how things are rolled out um, is, is sort of where we're at now. But the goal is, yes, to be as open as possible, um, while at the same time respecting that we're not going to give away the content of, uh, of those, you know, those publishers that are contributing to the knowledge graph. Last question. If I'm an author, Will I be able to use the tools, upload my manuscript, get a sense of how popular my manuscript is, and this then, is, then yeah. shop it around to people like so, us? So this is a great question, right? Um, so, so imagine, right, imagine a world in which an author could uh, uh, submit the manuscript uh, to this system and be told, you know, you have a 4% chance of being accepted in nature, a 6% chance of being accepted in, right, you know, that, that type of thing. Um, or, or even just you know the appropriateness for the journal uh, for the manuscript of certain journals. Um, I think the answer is in the long run there will be um, an individual end user version of this that has some of that functionality. Um, just getting back to the, the tap dancing notion, we want to do that in a way that doesn't open the door to unintended consequences so that there's gaming and, I mean, in a sense, there's, there's, there, there are efficiencies that could be recognized, right? Um, if, it, if it unclogged the system from some submissions that never had a chance of being accepted, um, we just, again, need to, to do that in a thoughtful way. One of the things we're doing is we're trying to engage directly with our publishing partners on questions like this to say, well, if we did this, what might the downside be? Um, and what might the, the reaction be among uh, our publishing partners? Uh, we don't pretend that we know all the answers. Thank you very much, guys. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, happy post-lunch meeting time. Um, Kenneth Gleason, uh, product manager uh, here at Highwire. This is actually my first uh, time at the Highwire's publishers meeting. I don't have the green strip, but treat me as if I do. So feel free to come up and talk to me about anything that you're interested in. I mainly work on JCore, but I'm on track to become a jack of all trades in product management, so I'm learning all about a lot in different areas. Um, and I'm pretty excited to be talking about enhanced discovery today um, and services that we're providing. Um, and we're going to give you an update on where we are on the roadmap uh, with some of these items. I'm either the luckiest man in the world or the most unluckiest because right after this, Honor Og has his ask me anything question. So he may point out some, uh, some concerns with my presentation or he might just be able to answer everything for me. So we'll find out. Um, so let's kick things off. So 
Highwire is dedicated to discovery. And one thing that's wonderful about Highwire is that we're extremely proactive with discovery. Um, we're always looking for new ways to provide um, discovery services and improve discovery services. Um, and the reason we do that is because the landscape's always changing and the way that people access content is changing. And we really wanna help drive users to your uh, publications. And 56% of our publishers um, have a strong desire to increase discoverability, and that's based across an aggregate business value map that we've generated. So it's a very strong desire to make that improvement. Um, so it's something we're very, very proactive doing, and we meet, meet uh, monthly with Google. As you can tell, Anurag being here today um, is a great thing. Um, and I'm also gonna be talking about a little bit about Crossref, and J Jennifer is here as also, so uh, feel free to uh, point anything out if you have any comments. All right, so 50, so here's some actual landscape of where we're at right now. 50 to 60% of our referrals are actually coming from Google and Google Scholar. Um, Google's web search is seeing a massive shift over into the mobile, uh, while Google Scholar is remaining static. Um, so Scholar is seeing about 10 to 15% mobile traffic, while um, web search is actually around 50%. Um, users are, increasingly not willing to have friction in their interactions with publications. So they're looking in other sources um, that are open, to say, um, to actually find content faster. Um, we also have a, a lag time for DOI registration um, that can be significant for published content. And this is, uh, covers two areas, um, some work that we'll be doing with Crossref as well as um, work that we'll be doing on the Highwire platform. So this is, this is sort of a, uh, an umbrella for the areas that we're going to address. All right, so looking at the roadmap for 2017, we have three different categories. Um, we'll be focusing on Google Web Search and Google Scholar improvements, mobile and off-campus user improvements, as well as uh, improvements for Crossref. To kick things off, we're gonna actually go with the first one. We're gonna go with Link Boost, uh, which actually provides an improved relevance ranking for Google for published content on uh, jCore. Um, so what it does is actually um, leverages the unique connection that we have for content on jCore uh, and the references. So we can actually drive more uh, cross-linking and uh, boost the relevance for content through our references on Highwire. So the way that we do that is that we actually are going to tune it so that we're actually providing direct links. Um, it was mentioned earlier that instead of having a, a lookup or something that, it's something that a search engine can't follow, um, these links will become the definitive link and therefore all our content leveraged across jCore will be able to be boosted in relevance. So it'll be easier to discover. Um, we're also going to tune the platform to actually link to uh, consistently link to the most relevant version of the article. That's the newest version, uh, the version of record. And then we'll provide links for those users looking for previous versions to um, actually access those old versions or previous versions as necessary. But in combination, this is what Link Boost will do. It will actually boost up the relevance of all the links. Um, it's gonna be a platform standard for jCore, um, so it's gonna be a service that's included, um, and it would be an opt-out, but we really want, because we really want everyone to be involved. This will allow us to boost across the entire platform, so everyone's relevance will be boosted. And we're gonna start in Q2, so we're starting off very soon. All right, so we're also gonna be doing folio improvements this year. Um, last year, we actually did citation metadata improvements so that uh, bibliographic metadata could be indexed uh, better in Google and Google Scholar. But in Q3 of this year, we're gonna make, be making two crucial improvements. Uh, we're gonna be uh, providing an optional free samples for the folio platform and books on published there. Um, what that'll do is it'll actually provide content to be indexed on Google and Google Scholar. Um, so there'll be a representative chapter for each of the uh, books, and we can provide front matter, back matter, 
and first chapter, which will provide a crucial source of indexable information, um, therefore boosting indexing on the Folio platform. Um, we are going to also be doing work with edited volume indexing so that um, individual articles within an edited volume can be also indexed. So those are two things that are coming down the line in Q3. So we're going to be talking a lot about access. And this is uh, obviously in the last couple of years has caused just a ripple in the industry. Um, so, and the way that we're going to address this um, under our Access Anywhere umbrella will help address issues like this. And I specifically chose this image because and highlighted it because this is a dead end where I don't have access to this content. And it took me a few minutes to find out what to actually do which actually ends up being a dead end. So if, as Kevin John, my favorite researcher, um, his, uh, he's getting a second doctorate right now. Um, he's, he's at home. He hasn't been on campus lately. Um, he's looking for new content, and he's looking for the something to read, and he hits this and says, oh, well, man, I don't know what to do. I have no idea where to find this article. Oh, well, there's this... I heard of this open source. Let me ask a friend or actually use this uh, Sci-Hub thing and let me, let me go there. Otherwise, if he was on campus, he would have had complete access very, very easily. And so the way we're gonna combat this issue is we're gonna start, and this is part of the Access Anywhere umbrella, is CASA. It's not just a clever name. It's an acronym, so we have Campus Activated Subscriber Access, and I think this is particularly great because CASA being at home. Um, and so what this offers is seamless access for users uh, for that are subscribers when they're off campus. Um, so this leverages Google Scholar, and as a researcher, let's say Kevin John has been to the, the library in the last couple of weeks, He's done his research. He's used Google Scholar to actually uh, search for articles. Um, Google Scholar is uh, recognizing him as a subscriber um, through his uh, Google account uh, or his personal computer. And he is therefore marked as a Stanford uh, you know, subscriber. So Kevin John goes home. He was, all of a sudden has a paper due and uh, he's doing a, some furious research. Right when he goes to Google Scholar and starts searching, he has access to all of his Stanford subscriptions. Highwire recognizes that subscription from Google Scholar, actually making, and makes the connection, and we create a voucher, and therefore he ha will have access um, based on the relationship um, that Google Scholar has proven to us. And what we actually do as we actually make that connection and verify it with Google Scholar. So we cover that uh, Kevin John's access and subscriptions. Um, we're including this as a platform standard. Um, this, so this would be uh, included with JCore. Um, again, this is an opt-out. So we really want everyone to take advantage of this because we really want everyone to be able to track and understand how their users are accessing content. So to get to the benefits of CASA, um, really what we're doing, and this is what we're doing across all our discovery tools and services, um, we want to reduce friction. We want to allow very quick and easy access to content, especially where they have a subscription. So we don't want to set up barriers or send them to barriers. So we're creating a new pathway for them to actually um, reach the content and then closing down a pathway um, for you know, reaching uh, sort of nefarious other sources where you can't get crucial information. Um, this also helps protect existing subscriptions and licenses. Um, it provides uh, uh, options to further monetize content because you're increasing your off-campus uh, readership. They're not just going so to some other source. Um, it reduces bounce rates and inadvertent turnaways like you would find on my previous slide. 
Um, and you also drive usage through increased subscriber recognition. Um, this is extremely important because as you're um, driving your numbers, you don't want to lose your readers elsewhere when they actually should be reading at the uh, you know, record or version of record. So another crucial point in this is, and this is you know, the scary part, is we're building an abuse of monitoring right from the start. So uh, we're not going to be able to just copy a link and send it over and say, oh, that's, that, it, it says I'm good. You know, it's, it, it actually, we will be uh, doing work here to make sure that it's not abused. We're going to be looking at um, the tokens, where it was uh, received, how many times it was received, geographic location. So we'll have a whole coverage there. And we'll also be uh, making sure that we're working well with Google Scholar. And it's something that we have been working with them on to make sure that uh, we're covering our uh, publishers' needs here. All right, so quick abstracts. This is another initiative that we're doing with Google Scholar. Um, Google Scholar, as I mentioned before, sees a lower source of mobile traffic. And what we're doing is we're actually working with Google Scholar to increase that uh, uh, viewership or readership through Google Scholar. Um, and also helping readers discover content in a way, in a faster way. Um, it's a significantly faster way uh, on mobile devices to actually discover content. And this works similar to like an accelerated mobile page, an instant page, um, which will provide a branded abstract experience for your, your reader. So it'll have your journal's branding, full abstracts, and then access to a download link and um, also, you know, to view the full HTML. Um, it's, what's great is that it's, rec uh, you know, recorded in, in compliance with counter, so you'll be able to view your abstract views, and this is something we'll be tracking um, and making sure that we're, we're covering all that traffic. Um, and this is also included as a platform standard for JCore. Um, so we, and, and also an opt-out, because we believe that um, your readers can really benefit from a, a faster interaction with the journal on a mobile experience. And we'll take a little journey here. We're gonna start on the left-hand side. Um, I think I might have gotten an older iPhone. I don't, uh, so th this is, a, this is a, maybe an older researcher. I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> was that ageist? <laughs> All right, all right, all right, I'm just, I'm gonna sink below the podium. This is actually why I chose the microphone on the podium. Um, so, thanks for looking at me like that, Todd, that was good. <laughs> all right, so I'm starting on the left-hand side. Uh, this is the quick abstract mock-up experience. So, uh, as a reader, I found an article I'm interested in, I click on the title, and I view a branded experience within Google. And what this does is actually reduces how many times we actually have to send cellular data out to read an abstract and view that information. So it, it is significantly faster. Um, as I've scrolled down on the furthest right-hand side, um, you, we'll show some links here um, about how to access the content, if that's exactly what they're looking for. Anurag? Yeah. But the power of this is when you are just scanning bar. Just as you scan new images, you can just click with your finger and you read one article after another after another. Mm. This is looking at one article. Look mm. how quick it works. Yeah. You got to reverse it this way now because you can basically just click, 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 click and scan through the individual abstract. And just you know, in terms of numbers, what you can look at, it takes kind of basically less than about a minute. But it takes right now, you're using about five seconds. So that is actually thing that will allow the mobile journals to finally take off. Yep. Sorry. No, 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 no. See, this is why this. So it did pay off. <laughs> You've. <laughs> So we'll do we'll do questions after, and, and Anurag is, is is happy to join in the questions. Thank you. All right. And our last item here is work that we'll be doing with Crossref, as well as work that we're going to be doing on the Highwire platform. Um, so 
what Crossref's early uh, content registration will do, as well as work we're going to do on the high wire, is significantly improve th the speed of DOI registration for new content. Um, and there's there's a number of reasons for this change. Um, so right now, DOIs aren't deposited until the content is actually published. Um, so that can cause a lag time. Um, Crossref will be actually changing this rule, and they have a um, a, a spec for this um, coming out in uh, Q3 of 2017. So we'll be doing work around that time period, uh, maybe a little after, to actually start doing early uh, DOI deposits. Um, and the lag time can actually be up to 12 to 18 hours, not just necessarily on the part of Crossref, but also on the side of um, on Highwire. Um, so if you have a, a press release and you have a really, really hot article and it's going to get press immediately, you know it, that DOI is lagged behind the actual press release, then unfortunately that DOI is going to hit a dead end or a, a, a page that's not there. So um, this it, it is actually a very important aspect of how um, DOIs are minted. So it, it's going to be help, these will be helpful changes that we're bringing. So. The first thing we're doing in Q2, um, we're going to no longer be uh, depositing DOIs um, and sort of wrapping them up and batching them and sending them at the end of the day. What we'll end up doing is actually sending as they're published. Um, this will help all public publications and articles on uh, the Highwire platform. However, it's going to be especially great for continuous publication, publish out of print, and preprint. So we can actually send that as we publish. Um, so it'll be the, the DOIs will be there faster. Um, the next part, we'll be working with Crossref. Um, and so we have an estimated Q3 time period um, and for the early content registration. And I wanted to give you uh, an idea of how this would look. Um, and so this is a sort of a workflow, but I publish an article that's uh, going to be very, very popular. Um, the media is all lined up to get this thing talked about. At the high wire staging area, what we'll do is actually send the DOI um, to Crossref for, with registra for registration with a very limit, limited set of metadata, um, and we'll work with be working with Cross Crossref on that limited set. Um, and so we'll go ahead and actually create that or mint that DOI. So if someone hits that DOI before the article is formally published, they'll see a very limited sort of embargo page. Um, not just a dead end, you know, sort of a coming soon. And w right when that article goes to publication, that DOI will already be available. So it'll, it'll get published, the new page will display with the, with the article, and that DOI will be already directed to that place so that, so that the DOI is available for reference as soon as it's uh, published. So... That's what we have. <laughs> and, and remember, Honorog has his Ask Me Anything after this, so I'm making it easy on myself. <laughs> yeah. uh, so why don't we go ahead and take uh, two questions. Uh, we're in just a few minutes behind. You heal in the back? Yeah, thank you. The answer to my question is probably yes, but any yes. usage on the <laughs> CASA is then part of the counter reporting? Yes. And will it be shown as used on the CASA or anyway? Is it identifiable for a library, for example? We're uh, defining that right now, actually. It, it will be defined as part of the library usage yeah. that the user is registered to. Uh, but yeah. we will also be able to get some metrics that say this is how much use okay. was CASA. So okay. we're defining that set and how we'd make that available. Yep. Rob? I always for, start too early. <laughs> for DOI early registration, Yes. so there's still going to be some lag between publication of the article and the final uh, deposit to Crossref. Yes. Or the queue at Crossref. Yeah. So is there a way in the early registration to include the, UR the predicted URL of the article so that if a user does get there through a press release, they can still click through to the article? It'll be a, an embargoed page. So, 
Can I, can I try the question yeah, again? Yeah, yeah. Because I think uh, there might be a misunderstanding. Okay. Uh, the, at least as we imagine it, this is all has to be tested, right? Uh, the, uh, the, if a user clicks on a DOI, it will go either to an embargoed page if the article is still embargoed, or it'll go through to the final published article if the article embargo is, is released. So there won't be any place where you, you get lost. But so in a press release, if the DOI URL is used, if the, the DOI URL and the, uh, the user clicks on it, yep. if the final deposit has, been, has not yet been made to Crossref, that won't lead to the yes, article. It will. It will. Yes, it mm. will. Uh, it's just the, the only thing that won't work in final form is the, uh, for you know, some bit of a lag period, is the final metadata. But the DOI works, whether the metadata says who uh, is the author, what is the title, and so on. So it, it will all go all the way through. Yeah. Hmm. The landing page is the article. In yeah. this case, so so the final URL for the landing page won't change. The DOI will be pointing there, so no matter what's displaying on the page, it will uh, resolve correctly. Uh, limited metadata. Uh, Crossref has, still has the uh, the spec on what's actually going to be available. Um, still out. It, well, I'm sorry. Can you? I couldn't hear you. Sorry, Richard. I was confused. Mm. What exactly will be on that landing page? Because if they haven't got the it, metadata, you've reached an embargoed article. Right. It's, it's a high wire landing page that you're going to get to. Right. Yeah. Right. That okay, That was. It's a high wire page. It's that's, not. A, that's my understanding. I suppose that's possibly wrong. All right. But yeah, the DOI will work. What I what I have learned is next time I will have a mock up for this, and especially when we do a webinar, and then we can actually kind of walk through it. Because it's visually easier than than actually you know verbally explaining. So, but so. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, we'll, I'm just thinking of, of what we can do to customize that page. That, that it will be, it will essentially look like a journal page, except there will be nothing there. No, it will say embar Have you ever gone to an embargoed article on your site now? Oh no, I haven't. Try it. It will look, it will look like that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. We, I mean, what we have to do is provide. The, Minimal enough information that we don't break your embargo if somebody actually gets to the page. The, the, there are relatively few ways they would get to the page, but mm. it could happen. Mm. All right, one more question, then we better go to our. With the, um, <coughs> early Sorry. With the Crossref early content registration, then, so presumably this is a, an opportunity for me to, or for us to deposit, uh, to get our DOIs and then even potentially share them with an author at proof stage, right? And mm -hmm. say, this is going to be your DOI. As soon as it's published, it'll be there. Yes, right. absolutely, yes. Uh, yes, you set, you set your DOI. Yeah. Uh, you, you give it to us. We don't create it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't see why that wouldn't work. I mean, if the author used it before our staging system got it, though, it wouldn't, it wouldn't even go to an embargo page. So, all right. We have, uh, thank you very much, Kenneth. Uh, we have uh, three concurrent breakouts now. Uh, the, the, there are two with the word Google in it. Don't, don't get confused. Uh, the Google Scholar metrics and Ask Me Anything session is here in this room. The, the other two sessions, Bench Press and Google Analytics, uh, are across the hall. There are signs uh, to direct you to those. So let's uh, take just a few minutes. Uh, if, if you aren't interested in any of the breakouts, I'd suggest you not stay in this room because it will probably be noisy. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, there's a living room out there in the middle if you'd like to go out there and work. <laughs>